In episode 11 of MobyCast, we continued last week's conversation regarding the negative implications of AWS's rapid growth. Welcome to MobyCast, a weekly conversation about containerization, Docker, and modern software deployment. Let's jump right in. Welcome to number 11 of MobyCast, Rich and Chris. Hey. Hey, how's it going, guys? It's going well here. I'm excited to do this one because I think we we left a lot on the table with last week's conversation about AWS collapsing under its own weight. But before we get started, I just want to find out from each of you what you've been up to this past week. Rich, what have you been up to? Uh, yeah, so this is the first week that I felt like I've been able to take a breath in a while. Um, we started an outbound strategy at the end of last year that has really started to kick in and work. And, you know, the, the downside to that is we really have to start focusing on, on, on processes and stuff like that. So last three months have been pretty stressful, but I feel like I'm finally above water. Days are feeling normal again. Um, and I'm getting out and, and hitting some golf balls. So, so life is good. That sounds pretty good. How about you, Chris? Uh, let's see. I, I, uh, took a trip out to sunny San Diego recently to meet with a client and kind of have a um, collaborative on-site design session, kind of working out like a roadmap for things for us to work on um, and kind of starting to dig into how do we start building out some visualization capabilities for all the data that's being collected by the software that we have been building. So kind of investigating a couple of different prongs there for what might be the best way especially given the fact that right now the, the data models are pretty complicated from many disparate sources. And so that provides some uh, unique challenges for us. So having fun with that. But more importantly, did you have any fish tacos or at least the burrito? <laughs> Unfortunately, no. But I, what I did have, though, um, I did get um, in and out. So um, uh, when I, when I, whenever, I, you know, here in Seattle, there is no in and out burger. Um, so when I'm in California, that's definitely high on the on the to-do list. So I indulged in a, in a double, double and fries animal style. Nice. Excellent. And then as for me, uh, you know, a couple of weeks ago, I told you both that I'd been reading a book by Ryan holiday called conspiracy about how Peter Thiel took down Gawker. And that was so good. I didn't remember the guy's name was Ryan holiday at the time. Um, and then later I told rich, Oh yeah, it was by Ryan holiday. And rich was like, Whoa, no way. He was the director of marketing for American apparel. And he's written this, other crazy book called Trust Me, I'm Lying. So I read that one um, mostly this week and I just it just blew my mind. Like it was written in 2012 and it's aside from maybe one paragraph in the entire book, the thing is relevant. Like, like it feels like it was written in 2016. I mean, it really just talks about the, the danger of, of fake media and how to create fake news and what will happen in a world with, with, the kinds of pressures that we have on writers to produce cheap content as fast as humanly possible. And it was eye opening. So definitely recommend that if you're listening and check out, trust me, I'm lying and and then take all the news you read with a grain of salt. It's good advice. (laughs) (laughs) All right. So we're going to continue talking about um, AWS becoming just too big for its own good and having too many capabilities for people to digest and what's going to happen with that. So last week we kind of ended up talking about that there were two business opportunities that I was, that I had in my mind. And one was for the other cloud providers to be better at competing and and maybe um, show a different face than what AWS is showing to the world. And then the other business opportunity that I was seeing and is um, just you know, this, this possibility for third parties to put um, services together in a way that's digestible and really for AWS to kind of move into the background. So there's, I'm actually just remembering that there's another, another part of this that I want to talk about that, that's, uh, that I want Rich to introduce, but let's start with this third party businesses idea. And maybe Chris, you can just discuss what you think third parties might be able to do to start to address this problem. Yeah. So it's just the idea of as as things become more complicated and there's not even just more complicated just just as the volume increases for um 
the various services and capabilities that are that are out there by AWS, it, it kind of becomes impossible for any one person to keep up on all of that. It's not that they're not smart enough or they're not mentally capable of, of doing that. It's just there's not enough hours in the day. And so to kind of keep track of all the best practices um, of, of using these things, as well as, you know, all of these services, they're, they're not isolated. They're, you, you put them together like, like Legos, um, building blocks to actually build what it is that you need for your application. So you're not going to use probably just one service. You're probably going to need to, to kind of put together, you know, four or five, 10 of these services or, or more. Um, so there's kind of like more of these, like these, uh, you think of it as going up the stack and it's kind of more like maybe application level or, um, subsystem level building blocks of services that, that are composed of the, of the, of the baseline services. Chris, so, I want to just, I, I want to just put a, put a, a pin in what you just talked about in terms of these building blocks of services and underline something that you started with, which is, you know, not having time and maybe, maybe it's not a good idea to spend all the time that it would take to keep up with AWS. And I just want to underline that if you're a CIO or a CTO and you're spending a good part of your week, just staying on top of what's going on with AWS or a good part of your quarter, that's time that you're not spending thinking about innovation for your domain, your own company. So that, that's got a real downside. If AWS gets too complicated, companies are not going to be able to be as innovative innovative if they if they have to know it all so okay so just want to underline that and then now i now we can go back to this this concept of building blocks and putting them together Um, right absolutely so yeah so think of them as recipes um where there are going to be some uh some pretty common common recipes that folks can put together and kind of just say here is a solution um for you to use um and that way you don't have to figure out like what is the best practice for stringing these, these six things together to, to do like um, near line, low latency archival of block level data that is across multi-region um, instead of knowing the, you know, the intimate details of how to architect that um, like, no, you can go um, someone else can kind of done the legwork for you and make sure that it's, that it's up to date with, with um, the latest and greatest. So there, I think there's lots of opportunity there that that's going to be one of the, the biggest um, ways to address this pain of there's just this, this furious pace of innovation um, in the cloud space with AWS and its services and capabilities. Um, it leaves a void for, for folks to come in and, and to help um, basically, you know, be some shoulders that you can you can stand on top of um, and not have to be an expert at every single service, every single capability. Instead, like you have a job to do and you have solutions that you need built. And basically you want to do that as, as quickly, as efficiently, um, and you know, as best of breed as possible. So getting help from third parties, Amazon itself, um, they have a whole team. Um they they call them answers and they're they're basically cloud formation stacks for doing these kinds of things. But even that's pretty low level, requires um some uh, some heavy lifting. I think there's gonna be more um companies coming into this space that that provide the value added services so that it, it really becomes pretty straightforward and turnkey um to 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 use these things. One of the things related to these third parties that I think that they can really address that's a pain point for Amazon is is understanding billing and predicting billing. So, you know, if you go to Amazon's um, help desk, what did you call it again? Uh, not their help desk, but their their solution sort of recommendation team. What was that called again? Um, so, yeah, so in their consulting solution architects division, they they have uh, one of the things they offer, they, they call them AWS answers. Um, answers. These are, these are cloud formation stacks for various different, like, common use cases. Of got services. it, got it, got it. Okay, yeah, we're, we're actually using one of those for HIPAA right now. Um, so if you use those, um, then then you're still kind of stuck with, okay, well, I've got this many EC2 machines, I'm planning on doing this much network traffic, I'll need load balancers, I'll need some Lambda functions running, um, you know, just adding and adding and adding and adding services and services and services. And it's like this unbelievable nightmare to understand what the billing even is and then what the billing is likely to be under different loads. Um, and I think that is an area where third parties just have an incredible possible, you know, potential for 
for demystifying and getting an advantage over using bare AWS. If they can, if they can make the pricing transparent, you know, you, this is what you want. This is what it costs. Um, as opposed to here's the 15 different ways this is going to cost you. That's going to, that's going to drive adoption towards them. I think. Yeah, there's, there's no doubt. Like that's one of the top concerns that, you know, folks would have is like, okay, how much is this going to cost me? And, um, you know, I don't want to be surprised by a, by a large bill. Um, just kind of having that predictability. Um, and that is very difficult right now. It's also, it's really difficult to like understand how do you build things so that they are the most cost effective? Like there, and Amazon gives you a ton of information on this. Um, so there are a bunch of various techniques, whether you use, um, spot instances or reserved instances, um, how you combine those two things instead of using on-demand instances. Um, and you can save, you know, thousands of dollars a month off your AWS bill, but it's pretty difficult, pretty challenging. <laughs> right, there's, right. there's no, there's no, you know, AWS answers cloud formation stack for that, um, that I, that I'm aware of. Right. So, um, just again, a, another opportunity in there, just all around, just billing, both in like just the insight into that and predictability as well as like, Hey, save me money. Right. So, so these third parties, they can, they can improve around billing and predictability. They can improve around approachability and solution providing. There's just so much room right now for third parties to jump in. Can you think of any third party? You know, this is a kind of a nascent area, but there's absolutely companies that are already doing this. Um, but I don't think that there are any winners. Like there's not the one company that's like, hey, we have 50 different AWS solutions and we are the the, the gorillas that are the best at de- delivering, you know, easy to use AWS solutions. But can you think of any companies that are starting to make headway in this area? There's none that um, kind of like stick out right now. Um, it's kind of ironic in a way because like there have been companies that have tried to do this in the past and they didn't do it well. And we've kind of seen their offerings and, and kind of like their presence in the space wither. Um, and it, it just depends on um, the, the space and whatnot. Rackspace is a company that kind of comes to mind as, sure, yeah. they, you know, they were, and I think they still do provide kind of like managed AWS services, kind of like they'll provide you a solution architect and they'll help you, you know, figure out what it is to build, but that, that whole experience wasn't nearly um, as powerful as I think as it, as it could be or should be. So I, I think there's been some, some V1, V2 of this um, that is the, the best is yet to come. Um, and there's going to be a lot more, um, a lot better solutions, more and more delivered as a service, as opposed to delivered via like consulting and, and basically people, you already seen Amazon do some of this themselves uh, with products like, um, well, Beanstalk was definitely one of those things that they launched to kind of make this much easier for, for folks to consume a whole bunch of, of various different AWS services to deliver a web application quickly. And uh, that's kind of being superseded by by newer technologies now. Um, but that was the space that they were, that was the problem that they were addressing there. And then, they also have uh, more recently uh, LightSail as a service to help you very quickly spin up EC2 instances, just get get up and running. So, and Amazon recognizes this. Um, they know it. It definitely benefits them to to take the complexity out of uh, these products and services to get people up and running as quickly as possible, so that they can start charging them as quickly as possible. Um, but I think. Th- what Amazon does in a space will be very limited compared to what what should be done and what could be done um, to a much to much uh, greater extent. Right. Yeah. You take the example of light sale, and it's like it's it's in the list of services right underneath EC2. It's not clear what it is. There's no there's no like, hey, look here. This is are you just wanting to use a machine quickly? This is where you should come. There's none of that. It's you're just as likely to click on EC2 as you are on light sale. Um, and, it, and they both get you to the same end. Uh, you have a machine that's running in the cloud, but there wouldn't be a way that you would know that. And that actually kind of brings to mind that the user console, the administrative interface that AWS has. And I think, Rich, you had a, a story that relates to this and, and why AWS might not be able to solve this problem. 
Yeah. Um, and, and just to kick that off, I mean, Amazon has never been known for their UI uh, ever. Even on Amazon.com, it still doesn't look pretty, um, but it is one of the most converting websites on the planet, right? So uh, I think that uh, the biggest problem for a company like Amazon to like really start investing in UI and UX is that it's probably not part of their culture, right? And so it would be a really difficult thing for them to accomplish, especially now that they have all of these different services that would need to sort of adhere to the same UI, right? Even though maybe some of them are are slightly different. And so this, the story that I always talk about is, you know, very recently Atlassian uh, updated the UI for Jira. Uh, a couple of years earlier, they acquired Trello. And so now Jira looks like Trello. Um, but about three months prior to that transition, uh, I had decided that I was going to learn the complexity of Jira because I'd heard so much about its power. And it was true. Once you figured it out, it was very powerful and it was worth the learning experience. But then they transitioned to this new UI, which is undoubtedly more beautiful. It changed the way that you had to do things in order to take advantage of this power. And so I was completely lost again. And so in one day, although they allowed you to go back right to the original or the classic view, eventually they were going to sunset that. Right. So I was either going to need to relearn everything um, or I was going to leave and I left. And the irony of that, <laughs> and, the, and the irony of that is that I use Trello now, right? It's like, Trello is just simple. So I can deal with the UI there, but Jira was so complex that I, I lost basically any foothold that I had to be efficient in the program. Salesforce did the same thing very recently. They have a beautiful UI, but they're smart enough to know that never change that experience on people. And so the classic editor will never actually be sunset. Basecamp does the same thing. Whenever they change things, they allow you to go back. So I have a feeling that had, and if you think about Google, like Google was around for like 15 years before they actually invested in UI, right? And there was a lot of opinion about that. And I think it comes down to the idea that UI is not necessarily a subjective thing, um, but it does have a level of art in it, which is clearly subjective. And I think that uh, it's a very dangerous thing when you can train somebody on a poor user experience. The beauty of the admin is that, well, you know, you're not trying to convert people anymore. They've already paid. So if, if they find value in your product, they will learn that UI. The only thing that they can do is, is make it easier for new customers. But regardless, all of the legacy customers will be affected by it and mostly in a negative way. So the idea that these third party companies can come in and, and create their own subjectivity as to how things should look is great because every customer will be a new customer. And so they won't need to worry about the way that things were with AWS. And I think that that opportunity is something that I would suspect Amazon really wouldn't want to compete against because it's something that inherently is not part of their, their overlying culture because they've never really implemented it in any of their products. I agree with that, Rich. And I, and I think that, you know, this is going to be an interesting thing to watch. I think it's almost like what's happened with computer programming in general, um, where maybe, you know, many years ago you had to know what was happening in terms of chip architecture and assembly languages in order to write good software. And then eventually you just didn't need to know that stuff anymore. Um, and, and I think the cloud may, may be sort of the same way where in order to get business applications written, eventually we might, you know, those of us that are in the business of building business applications, you might not have to know anything about what's happening on AWS. Um, we may we may be able to to get our most innovative solutions out there by letting other you know deeper down the stack companies deal with AWS directly and provide us the tools and services that we need to to create innovative solutions for for business. Um, so it'll be interesting to watch this transition take place. I think that we can wrap up pretty much with this, but I just wanted to, you know I don't want to end it myself. So uh, I do want to give Chris one more opportunity to, to say anything else that's on your mind about AWS falling over under its own weight and, and what will happen in the future. Yeah, I definitely think um, pace of innovation is definitely going to increase. Um, we're all going to have to figure out ways to um, mix that, that blend of getting stuff done versus um, kind of being aware of, of, of what's out there. For me, like a kind of like a a core underlying principle I've, I've had for just about anything I do is just identify like, what is your core competency? Like what is, what is it that makes you different? And so this is for any business or company, like what is, what is the secret sauce? What is your competitive disadvantage that you have that makes you unique and allows you to win? 
that's where you should be spending most of your time. Um, if, and that means like, Hey, if, if like being an expert in S3 and, and Dynamo DB and SQS and, uh, ECS, um, you know, that, that may not be part of it. Right. So you'll, as we, as, as, as the, the landscape evolves, kind of taking advantage of, you know, these other sources for that, that allow you, um, to, to get up to speed with those things without spending a lot of time. So you can focus on your core competency. It's going to be key to you to, to thriving in this environment of, of constant innovation, as opposed to being crushed by the weight. <laughs> yes. I think that's a great way to end it. Um, thanks again, Chris and Rich for another great conversation and I'll talk to you next week. Thanks guys. Bye. Well, dear listener, you made it to the end. We appreciate your time and invite you to continue the conversation with us online. This episode, along with show notes and other valuable resources, is available at mobicast.fm forward slash one one. If you have any questions or additional insights, we encourage you to leave us a comment there. Thank you, and we'll see you again next week.